In this video, I'll be teaching you how to set up the Playdate SDK, primarily for Windows. Also, I'll show you how to structure your project, basics on how to build a game using the Playdate SDK with the Lua programming language. And lastly, we'll be building this simple game together where you try to pick up as many coins as you can before the time runs out. Let's get started. First step is to install the Playdate SDK. You want to navigate to the Playdate website at this link. Accept the terms of the license agreement, which conveniently lays out what it means in simple terms at the top, and download the SDK installer. You can manually set up a bunch of things and use whatever text editor you like, but I think the best way would be to use Visual Studio Code along with using this great template made by Whiterib in order to allow for automatic builds and autocomplete. First, go to code.visualstudio.com and install Visual Studio Code. VS Code is essentially a lightweight text editor that's specifically designed for writing code. Then, go to the GitHub link in the description and download the template. After you've extracted the zip file, you can rename the folder to whatever you like. Start off by right-clicking the closed sim PS1 file, going to the properties, and checking unblock. PowerShell scripts are blocked by default for security purposes, but this one just closes the Playdate Simulator application. Next, run the add environment variable command file, which will automatically add some environment variables for you. This essentially lets your system know where the Playdate SDK is located. Right after that, look up your VS Code executable, get the file location, go to its properties, and in the compatibility tab, check run this program as an administrator. To start VS Code as an admin, this allows VS Code to run the PowerShell script. Then, launch VS Code and open the folder you renamed. There should be a pop-up to install recommended extensions in the bottom right corner. Go ahead and do that. They help with programming in Lua. You should now be able to go to the terminal tab and click Run Build Task, or to use the keyboard shortcuts shown to compile your project and run the Playdate Simulator. If you're getting some sort of permissions error about running PowerShell scripts, press Control shift p and type settings.json. Open the settings, Add a comma here and on the new line paste this, which allows VS Code to bypass the execution policy. I'll leave a link to what to paste in the description. If you follow the last steps, you can go ahead and delete the readme, the environment variable command, as well as all the files in the source folder except main.lua. You will always need a main.lua file for your project. According to the Playdate SDK documentation, a recommended file structure is to put additional Lua files in the same directory as the main Lua file, along with having an images subfolder and a sound subfolder, which allows you to easily access your assets from your code. Open main.lua and feel free to delete everything here if you use the template. First thing you usually want to do is import some core libraries that are provided with the Playdate SDK. These four are pretty much used in every project, so you can feel free to import these ones, but additional features require additional imports. Like the crank library if you want to use some crank specific functions for example. On the next line, you can create a function called playdate.update. This is the main loop for the game. This function is called every frame right before it's drawn. By default, the playdate runs at 30 frames per second, but this can be changed. If you're familiar with Love2D, this differs in the fact that the playdate has no draw loop. It only has an update. Almost everything in your game will be somehow controlled by this update loop. Let's say we want to set some things up before the game starts. We can just create a function and call it in the main file. Let's make a function called initialize and call it before the update function. Now, what can we initialize? Let's start off by making a player sprite. Sprites are graphics objects defined by the Playdate SDK that have a lot of built-in functionality. I've went ahead and added this 32 by 32 pixel player sprite into the images folder. We can start off by defining a player sprite local variable at the top level so that it can be accessed anywhere in the file. In the initialize function, we can create a local variable called player image and use playdate.graphics.image.new and pass in the path to the player image. This loads the image. Notice that while the player image has a .png extension, we do not need to pass that into the path. Next, set the player sprite variable to playdate.graphics.sprite.new and pass in the player image. This creates a new sprite instance. You might have realized that we use playdate.graphics twice already. This is a commonly used variable, so we can create a shorthand to make our lives easier by declaring a constant local variable, gfx, and setting it equal to playdate.graphics. We can replace the instances of playdate.graphics with gfx, which is easier to manage along with the added benefit of a slight performance improvement. We can then move the player to the middle of the screen with the move to function. Note the use of a colon instead of a dot. This is because we're calling move to on this particular instance of a sprite. 200, 120 is the middle since the playdate screen resolution is 400 by 240 pixels, with the coordinates 00, 00 in the top left going down to 400, 240 in the bottom right. Then, a very important step is to call add on the player sprite. This adds the sprite to the display list so the system knows to draw that sprite. As to when the system draws the sprite, you need to call gfx.sprite.update 
in the update loop. This tells the sprite class to update everything in the draw list on every frame. If we execute the build task, you should see the player sprite in the middle of the screen. Let's go over adding a background. There are two main ways to draw a background. The first one is using the tile map system from the SDK, which I'll cover in a later video. But the second is using set background drawing callback, which we'll use here. I went ahead and added a 400 by 240 pixel background in the images folder. We can load the background image into a local variable with gfx.image.new, and then after that, let's call the set background drawing callback function. This takes in one input, a function with parameters x, y, width, and height. What set background drawing callback actually does is a convenience function where it creates a sprite the size of the screen, adds it to the draw list, and draws it at the lowest z index so it will always be behind everything, along with a couple other things. We can go ahead and draw the background image using the function draw from the top left corner of the screen. However, there is one additional thing that we can do here for some performance optimization. The system keeps track of something called dirty recs which are essentially the bounding boxes of every sprite that has graphically changed on the screen and needs to be redrawn. From my understanding, what's passed as x, y, width, and height is a bounding box that encapsulates the dirty recs on the screen. And so we can limit the drawing to just those regions and we won't waste processing time on drawing something that hasn't changed. We can do that by setting a clipping rectangle with set clip rect before drawing and clearing it afterwards. If we run the game, we should now see the background. Let's move the player by going over into the update function. First, I'll create a local variable to hold what we want the player speed to be. Next, we can check for player input by using the button is pressed function. Let's check for the up button by using the constant k button up. Here are the constants for the other buttons. If we press up, we can move the player by using the move by function and moving the player up by player speed which in this case moves the player up by four pixels every frame. Let's repeat this with the other directions. If we run this now, then you should be able to move the player around. I'm not going to go too in depth into timers in this video, but there is something that in any average complexity game you'll usually need to do, which is updating the timers at the end of the update loop. It's similar to Sprite Update, where it tells all the timers in the game to update. And since timers are a common tool, along with being used internally for some other playdate elements like the grid system and the crank alert. You don't want to forget this if you end up using an element dependent on the timer. Let's put a timer in the game. I'll start off by creating a local variable to hold the timer and another variable which will be the playtime in milliseconds. We can do 30 times 1000 to denote 30 seconds in milliseconds and create a function called reset timer to set the timer. We can call playdate.timer.new and pass in the duration of the timer which is playtime, the starting value of the timer, which we want to be playtime since we're counting down, and the final value of the timer, which should just be zero, along with the way that we want the value to progress, which we can just do linearly. I'm going through this very quickly, but in a future video, I'll go more in depth into timers and these easing functions. Let's call reset timer at the end of the initialize function. We can show the current time by using gfx.drawText. The first argument we pass in is the text, which can just be the string time concatenated with the timer value. Since it's in milliseconds, we can divide by 1000 to convert it into seconds. And since it'll display a bunch of decimals, we can use a ceiling function to round it up. The last two arguments are x and y coordinates, which I'll just set to 5, 5. Lastly, we want to stop the player movement when the timer hits zero and require a button press to reset the game by creating a quick conditional. If the play timer's value is zero, we can check to see if the A button has just been pressed. Then we can reset the timer. Else, just process the movement as normal. If we run the game, we can see that there's a timer in the top left corner, and once it hits zero, we'll be unable to move until we press A, on which the timer will reset. Let's wrap up this simple game by adding some sort of objective in the form of picking up coins. I went ahead and added a simple coin sprite to the images folder. Let's create a local variable coin sprite to hold this as well. And in the initialize function, we can do the usual of loading the image and creating the sprite. For moving the coin, let's give it a random position. I'll create a move coin function that generates a random x position. I'll do between 40 and 360 since there's a timer on the top left. So this will spawn the coin away from the edges of the screen to avoid covering up the timer. And do the same for the y position. Then we can move the coin sprite to that random location. Now. This is not random yet since we need to seed the random function first. And we can do that by calling random seed with the current time, which can be accessed through get seconds since epoch. I'll call move coin and then add it to the draw list. We should also move the coin when the game is reset. For the final task, we need to detect when the player has picked up the coin. 
Luckily, sprites have a built-in collision system. It's quite feature-packed. My next video will be covering everything regarding the collision system for the Playdate SDK, so make sure to subscribe to not miss that. But for now, let's just use some of the basic functionality. We can create a collision shape for the player and the coin by using set collide rect. The first two arguments are the coordinates where the collision rectangle should begin. So let's just make that the top left at 0, 0. The last two arguments are the size of the rect. We can make this easier by just using the size of the sprite, which can be called by get size. Let's do the same thing for the coin. If we were to run the game at this point and go to view, show sprite collisions, you should be able to see the collision boxes for the sprites. We can do very basic collision detection by using overlapping sprites to return a list of all the sprites that are overlapping the coin sprite. We can then use the pound sign or hashtag to get the length of the list. If it's greater or equal to one, that must mean the player is overlapping the coin since there's no other sprites in the game. So then we can move the coin. Let's also create a local score variable and increment it by one. If you've used the Lua before, you may be surprised to see this syntax here. The Playdate has actually implemented a small superset of Lua and has added assignment operators and table helper functions for our convenience. Let's also reset the score when the game is reset. Finally, let's draw our score by using the draw text function again, this time on the top right. If we run the game now, we should now have a fully functioning game. I've left relevant links in the description and subscribe to not miss out on my future Playdate content. If you thought this was helpful, you can leave a like as well. Join my Discord if you want to talk shop and see you next time.